Martin. Here's my experience. I started the podcast in September of 2016. Over that time, I've covered about 230 disappearances, mostly in the United States, a few in Canada, and one from the country of Angola. And in doing those 230 disappearances, I've done about 300 interviews for those episodes. I have a total of about 265 episodes. There are some update episodes and some special edition episodes, but about 230 disappearances, 300 interviews. And earlier this year, uh, as an example, uh, myself and the program were featured on the TV show 48 Hours uh, in regards to the disappearance of Janelle Matthews in 1984 from Greeley, Colorado. And in fact, that trial is starting next week. And I did an interview two years ago with the um, main suspect in her uh, disappearance and her remains were found in uh, 2019. So for 35 years, it was a missing persons case. Her remains were found by accident. And Steve has been a person of interest since 1984. He contacted me. I interviewed him in 2019. Well, he is now on trial for her murder. And actually, uh, the prosecutor is flying me out there next week to testify in that murder trial, which starts actually today or tomorrow. So, and because of that interview, uh, earlier this year in March, the program and myself uh, were featured on 48 Hours. Moving on. The basics. What is a disappearance? It's simply a person is expected to be at some location, but is not for an extended period of time based on the circumstances. That last part uh, is very important, based on the circumstances. So you were coming to class today. You're supposed to be here. You're not here. Um, Michelle or one of your other professors wonders where you are. I guess you're a missing person, but it's not maybe worrisome yet. However, if you don't show up for any of your classes for the rest of the day, you don't show up, you know, if you have a roommate in your dorm or wherever, that person doesn't see you to uh, the next day, then it starts to get a little more serious. Now, of course, if you're late 15 minutes for this class, that's no big deal. If you're driving across the United States and somebody is expecting you at 3 o'clock on a Saturday, they're not going to sound the uh, alarm if you're not there at 3. Maybe if you're not there the next day, they might get a little worried. But it, once again, based on the circumstances, that's all it takes for a disappearance to be termed as such. In addition, anybody who knows you, who knows the person, seemingly can't say where the person is. Now, the reason I say seemingly is because many times when it is a murder, when we suspect a murder has occurred in a disappearance, it's usually somebody the person knows very well. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going to go through some examples. Even though each disappearance is unique, there are certainly patterns. You can put them in categories, and that can certainly help anybody understand them better. And these are the, I'm going to go into these in much uh, greater detail. But the first one, the man said, no, relationships are the number one cause of disappearances. What that means to any of you. I'm a single guy. Um, my odds of going uh, missing are less than any of you out there who may be in a relationship or married. That is what the stats say. Now, for single people, if you can avoid uh, any addictions, any bad choices in your life, the odds of you going missing are even then even lower than that. But relationships are the number one cause of disappearances, and that's why uh, we're going to talk about the man said. We're also going to talk about drugs play a role. Not the main factor, but they are a factor. Drugs play a role. The art of luring. Uh, enticing people to do things that they normally wouldn't do. The walk-off. It's a murder, but... Well, we know it's a murder, but what exactly happened? And then the final category I'll be talking about is a lig of, the, of their own. This is a category in which these disappearances are so unique, they cannot be put into any category. And I'm going to be going through each example. So Now, the best example is a disappearance I covered last year. Of course, this is a very new disappearance, uh, one of the newest that I've covered from June 20th of 2019, Prairie Village, Kansas, and uh, that's Angela Green. She was originally from China, 
Her husband, husband uh, is an American. They got married. They moved to Kansas. They had a daughter, married several years. And what happened was um, Angela, I think, was a very protective mother. She was worried about the, the direction that her daughter was headed in life. Her daughter was a guest on the program uh, last year, along with Angela's cousin. I did two interviews for that particular episode, which is rare. And what had happened was Angela kicked her daughter out of the house because her daughter, uh, once again, was not living her life the way Angela thought she should. I didn't see any big deal about it, but I'm not a parent. So, but she did. A few days later, Angela goes missing. And what her uh, husband said, his name is Jeff, he told both the daughter and other people before the police got involved, oh, uh, yeah, after uh, our daughter, after Angela kicked our daughter out, yeah, she lost her mind, and I had to take her to a psychiatric hospital, and that's where she was. He wouldn't name the psychiatric hospital. He wouldn't say whether it was in Kansas or Missouri or Iowa or Nebraska or Texas, Oklahoma. He wouldn't say where it was. He wouldn't give the name. Then when people started getting into this deeper, he said, oh, you know what? Um, no, she died. She had a, a, a heart attack or something in this psychiatric hospital, and she died in the hospital. Even though, and there's no death certificate in the state of Kansas or anywhere else regarding her, uh, regarding any of this. In addition, when the police finally de did get involved, the family tried uh, to handle it on their own for a little bit. Um, but when the story started, of course, as you're, you're probably hearing that, you know, how could he tell these stories? Yeah, I know. Um, when the police showed up, though, he changed his story again. He changed his story and said, oh, yeah, she went out and got in a vehicle with somebody and she took off. So he totally flipped his story. Now, you should know Jeff Green, Angela Green's husband, is still a free man. He's still walking around a free man. Why? Because Angela hasn't been found. We still don't know what he did with her. But he surely killed her. And in, in the, you know, sometimes when I do the program, we have to, I have to worry about defamation and really calling out people. And that's not really what I do on the program. But everybody, I think, could read between the lines when I covered this particular disappearance to know that Jeff did something. Now, it might have been by accident. It might have been a domestic violence situation, um, you know, that went that one step further to uh, killing somebody. But that's not what he said. And so she is still missing. Uh, you can see that disappearance is now over two years old, and I don't know if it's any closer to getting solved. But uh, Angela's daughter, Jeff's daughter, certainly believes that her, her father did something to her mother. But that is probably the best example of a man said, just creating stories. And it's, it's amazing how many stories these guys will come up with that don't make any sense but they continue to get away with it, and, and it, it is disturbing. And the reason that is is because prosecutors uh, many times, most of the time, will not bring murder charges against any suspect, man or woman, whoever, um, without a body. And I think a lot of these people who commit these murders know if I can make this body disappear, then the odds of me being charged with that person's murder are a lot lower. A, 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 it's... Thousand, a million times lower. So, so Angela Green, still missing. The best example, though, is uh, a disappearance. Uh, the formatting was not good on that. The war is sticking out there all by itself. But um, Noah Davis, he went missing from Ringgold, Georgia, July 28th, 2014. Now, this is a disappearance that had all, and that's Noah right there. That's a, this is a disappearance that all sorts of rumors regarding all, I mean, it was just crazy. And some other podcasts had covered his disappearance and it did nothing but make the rumor mill spin faster and faster and faster. And I had his half brother, Jason Stevens on the program. Um, was it this year? Time guy flies by so fast. Uh, it was early this year, very uh, right at the beginning of this year. And, Luckily, uh, Jason could give a very uh, solid story. He's not a suspect in Noah's disappearance. But in talking to Jason, I got to speak to some of the people who knew Noah at the time. Now, of course, there are bad things and good things as time passes regarding disappearances. Some of the bad things, of course, suspects die. Uh, they may go missing. You lose touch with them. Uh, evidence gets lost, all sorts of things. 
But some of the good things, some of the good points about time passing is, especially with drug cases, is that people clean their acts up. They get sober, they go get a program. Maybe they get sent to jail and that sobers them up. And so I was able to talk to some of the people who have uh, gotten their lives on the right path about that time. In particular, a young woman who saw Noah on the very day of his disappearance she was like, oh, I just, the days were running together. We weren't sleeping. I can't even tell you in what order we were doing things back then, what day was which and everything else. But still, she was believable because she, um, you know, she cared about Noah and that she wanted to help. And she, you know, luckily um, does not have an addiction anymore, went back to school. And I think she's doing a lot better now. But I did talk to some other people, and it's amazing who haven't cleaned their act up in the last seven years and still have uh, problems and addictions, and they just, their, their stories are so convoluted. It is just, it's, it, I feel sorry for them. All I'm looking for is disappearance information, but you can tell they have so many things going on in their lives. But this is a perfect example. There's all these rumors, mainly because these people just could not remember things correctly. Now, what happened, though, in this particular disappearance is after uh, Noah's uh, brother was on the program, we discovered uh, sometime this summer, this past summer, that a bone had been found in the area where Noah went missing. Now, the story is that Noah was with the, um, a, a woman. They went to his uncle's house. They were uh, getting high. I think it was heroin. And he just walked off. That was their story. And he said he was going to walk home, which was only like a mile or something like that. Never ended up at home. And there was all sorts of rumors. Oh, these people attacked him and everything. What, was ha what happened was, though, a bone was found in the area between his uncle's house and his own house. And that bone was determined to be Noah's. But the police had had it for a few years. And maybe this is something you may not realize if you just watch TV. Um, DNA testing takes a lot longer than it does on any of those shows you see on TV. It could take a year or longer. Um, so it finally uh, got done, the DNA testing, and that one bone, I don't even know what bone it is, I've not seen a picture of it or anything, was Noah's. Now what probably happened is that he was walking home, overdosed, died, animals come along and start taking him apart go off in a million different directions, but there was still some bones left. That was the one that was tested, and it was Noah. Now, I will tell you, because of what has gone on over the last seven years, that the family still believes he was murdered. In fact, the guest, Jason, believes that. Uh, his other brother, Josh, believes that. I have to tell you, I am not uh, convinced of that. Once again, just because of my experience. I've told Jason that, but he's going to do what he's going to do. I'm convinced that there was no foul play in Noah's disappearance, even though for the last seven years, that's all that's been talked about. So there, that's probably the best example of drugs playing a role. Best example, and the reason I can use this as an example is because this is um, a case that's uh, going to be going to trial. Uh, you can see there, Tyler North, fairly recent disappearance, June 24th, 2018, Harlan County, Kentucky, lured by his, to a park by his ex-wife. They were divorced, but they were still doing the friends with benefits situation. And he was at his sister's, they were texting back and forth, and they were going to get together in this park late at night, and he went there after being at his sister's, and never to be seen again. His truck was later found torched. And, but his ex-wife and her new boyfriend have now been charged with his murder. They have found remains. They're still in the process of trying to identify whether those remains are Tyler's or not. But that is a perfect example of luring. Luring, in this case, a woman luring a man for sex. He shows up. It's an ambush. Tyler is killed. And these two people dispose of her, uh, his remains and then act like, no, nope, nope, you never showed up. We don't know what you're talking about. Luckily, uh, lo the law enforcement in this area have, has done a, have done a nice job in trying to figure out what happened, and these two people are going to be going on trial for murder. Best example, David Schrader. In the 24 hours before his disappearance, he decided he didn't, was not going to pick one of his children up at a football game. Instead, he took a foster child that his family was caring for out. The foster child was like 16 years old. 
They went out to a bar. He got the 16-year-old drunk. They stayed out all night. When he came home the next day, he acted toward his wife like it never happened. And then later that day, he walked off. So in that last 24 hours before he disappeared, he had... Um, his personality had totally changed. And what they found out afterwards is David had had a drinking problem back in the 1990s. After he went missing, um, they discovered hidden bottles of alcohol over the house. So he had obviously had a relapse, and I'm sure that had something to do with his disappearance. But he surely walked off, and maybe because he felt guilty about what happened, uh, until we find his remains. Of course, I'm hoping he's still alive, and maybe we'll be able to ask him. But it's been uh, a little over nine years now and uh, just was not in the right frame of mind. But that is a very stereotypical walk-off. Best example, Dorian Myers, uh, disappearance from Florida, January 10th, 2006. She went out um, to play poker at a couple different, uh, there was like a benefit poker tournament going on somewhere. And she came home. She was a supporter of military uh, families and uh, like wounded warriors projects, things like that. She had met a couple of vets. She invited them back to her place. Um, and later that night, her house was torched. Her car was torched 80 miles away. Somebody stole her car. And in fact, with the house being torched, it's obvious that whoever did it locked her pets, a dog and a cat, in a room so they couldn't escape. So they wanted the, the, the pets to die too. That is still unsolved. Um, and no idea who did it. Uh, they're still looking for these two guys that she allegedly um, she met and went home with 15 years, uh, 15 years later. Very unusual, though, for there to be two suspects in a disappearance. But surely she was murdered. They couldn't get any evidence from the house because it was torched. Couldn't get any evidence from the car because it was torched. Burned to the ground. You can find those pictures online. But that's a good example. It's a murder, but there's not much that can be done about it because you just don't know who did it. Example, Dale Kerstetter, September 12th, 1987, Bradford, Pennsylvania, which is like up in the central area of Pennsylvania. What happened here? Uh, a lot of people know about this disappearance because it was featured on Unsolved Mysteries back at the time. Security guard at a glass making plant. Well, to make glass, they have these kilns that are lined with platinum. And somebody went into this plant while he was a security guard at night, took him hostage, cut a section of platinum out of one of these kilns, and it was all caught on video. And the person uh, was holding a gun to Dale, uh, you know, using him as a hostage. Dale was never seen again. Whoever committed this crime. Never seen again. Now, what I learned was the, th the, the theft of platinum in the 1970s, 1980s, fairly common, more common than I would have ever expected. But Dale, the, the security guard at this plant, never seen again. Now, my belief, I have to tell you, and is that uh, I think he was in on it. I think he ended up being the patsy. I think he and whoever did this, he goes, you come in here, I'll pretend like I'm trying to stop you. You still will split the funds. I think he got double-crossed. And who actually cut the uh, platinum out of the kiln uh, caused his disappearance because the guy wanted it all for his own. But um, I've gone through examples. Anybody have any questions before uh, I go on? Uh, anything that uh, was interesting to you? Anything that you thought was unclear? Anything about the program? Anything about any disappearance cases? I'll be glad uh, to answer them. If not, I have a, a few more slides for you. I'll just go. Yeah, please. Go ahead. <laughs> so, go ahead. I'm ready. Um, so my first one was, since you don't have a background in CJ, like, how did you end up doing podcasts? Um, it was just a bunch of things that came together. Uh, my first exposure to disappearances happened in the 1970s with the show uh, In Search Of, hosted by Leonard Nimoy, who played Spock on Star Trek. And then it went to Cops, then it went to Unsolved Mysteries, and then the, the uh, internet started, and then I was a uh, background in public speaking, I have a background in performing, I have a, a technical background, just all kind of came together, fin finally, at the age of 46. <laughs> Like the Gabby 
Um, internet's great. Internet's horrible. I think it depends on the person. Uh, I would like to think that the way that myself and my assistants have used the internet to work on these disappearances is, is the right way. But it depends on the person. Uh, like I said, I think too many people do see it as entertainment. Too many people do see it as, oh, I can be the hero. Look at me, look at me. And really, they're getting into things probably that they don't understand. That's, you know, that's, you know, kind of why I'm here. That's why I do the program. It's not just a program to uh, cover these disappearances and, um, you know, get exposure for them and help um, the families behind the scenes because that's a lot of what I do. But it's also to teach all the listeners what goes on in disappearances. So it just depends. It depends on the person. You know, I think you have to have some humility and modesty when you're doing it and not think that you're going to solve it in a second just because nobody else could. You know, a lot of keyboard jockeys out there not knowing what they're doing. That is true. But I would never stop anybody from using the internet to help. Okay, and I said, uh, so the show Tiger King talked about how Kara Baskin killed <laughs> and all that. Do you believe in that? Do you think she killed him? I, 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 I have to admit, I am not an, an expert in that. I, and then the funny thing is, that's where I live. I live in the Tampa area. So that is all very close to me. But uh, I'm, I, 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 I stay away from commenting on cases that I really don't know a lot about. I know it's certainly, a, what was that, Netflix? Was that on Netflix? I have Netflix. I've never watched it. I, I mean, I know uh, okay, all right, thank you. So I, I just can't comment on that. I, I'm sorry. I just don't like commenting on things I just don't. Uh, question in the back. If I'm going to take a question back here. Please. I do know about David uh, Poli uh Is it Polites? I, I, yeah. I, Politis. Okay. I, I have talked about him. I do a live show on our YouTube channel every Wednesday night. Uh, Unfound podcast channel on YouTube uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern. It's about a two-hour show, and I've talked about him before. I'll be honest. Um, I'm not a big fan of. David, I don't know him. I've never spoken to him. I've never had any contact with him at all or anything. He's never emailed me. I've never tried to contact him, even though he does do something similar that I do. Um, I just don't think he's right. Uh, I know that, for example, uh, you know, he talks a lot about all these people who disappear in national parks. And what I would say to that, he thinks there's some like serial killer or something going on out there. As my experience... Uh, with all these disappearances, is that the reason these people disappear in these areas is because these are some of the most dangerous places in the United States. Okay, people get their new new hiking boots, they get their new tent, they get their new this, their new that, and they suddenly think that you know you know they they're you know they can live off the land for the next two months. They get into things that are over their heads. That's that's my opinion regarding that. I, I don't know what else he says. I will ha I have to admit that. Him going on the coast to coast AM radio show once in a while probably, in my opinion, is not the best choice either, given other things that they cover on there. I would never go on that program. But uh, I just look at the, the facts in a different way that he does. So, um, uh, you know, that's where I, I stand regarding him. Did anybody, anybody else? Any other questions? You want to have another question? Okay. Two more. Go ahead. Great. I'm, he I, I'm here to serve. About, I'd say, unfortunately, I think it's less than 20. I was actually going to just go through a couple of those, but that's fine. Um, uh, less than 20. Um, some of them were murders. Remains were found. Some of them were suicides. Some of them, uh, the remains were found by accident. It's less than 20. How much did my program have to do with the solution of all of them? I don't know. Maybe a little bit. And I've certainly moved some other disappearances forward, even though they've not been solved yet. But uh, any person who takes this stuff serious will tell you, disappearance is the toughest of the toughest of the toughest of the toughest. And so, you know, being it's less than 10%, that's, that sounds about right. Yeah. Um, of those 
There has been one person that has been alive. Uh, he was uh, it's a dis uh, disappearance from uh, Texas. His name was Patrick Reed. And it seems that he just decided he didn't want to be around his family and friends anymore. And his family ended up finding after we covered his disappearance that he had pictures taken. There was actually a website of a woman that he knew of pictures of him with her, certainly after his disappearance date. Now, whether he is alive in 2021, I couldn't tell you. But he certainly did walk off out of his life. And I think he went to live with this woman and, and they were a couple. Um, but that is the only one. Not common. It's not common. It's just not. Uh, most remain, when remains are found, they're usually found outside. The most common way is buried. Um, although, and then I would say the second most common way is landfills, that they figure out that uh, a body was dumped in a trash can and then it got transported to landfill and then they have to go search. Very common. Yeah. He's a lot more that appropriate answer would be no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate it. Here we go. Oh.